All right. Well, welcome everyone. So excited to be here with you. I'm handing it over to Mary to introduce me, which is a little awkward, but. <laughs> welcome everyone. I'm incredibly honored to introduce Dr. Annalise Singh as president of the Society of Counseling Psychology. Annalise, whose pronouns are she, they, is a social justice scholar, author, speaker, and community organizer who speaks on a wide variety of racial healing, racial justice, and LGBTQ plus topics. Until just a couple weeks ago, she was professor and associate dean of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Education at the University of Georgia and has just begun her role as the first chief diversity officer at Tulane University. Dr. Singh has integrated leadership, community organizing, research, and practice throughout her career. Her racial healing handbook provides activities to challenge privilege, address systemic racism, and engage in collective racial healing. Her workbook, the Queer and Transgender Resilience Workbook, focuses on skills for LGBTQ plus healing, empowerment, and social change. She recently has done NIH R01 funded work with trans and non-binary people in a longitudinal study, and is a licensed psychologist and counselor who has maintained a largely pro bono practice with queer and trans folks of color and immigrant folks over the years. During the past year, Dr. Singh has been the right leader for the right time. She led us through unprecedented times in both our country and our organization. She worked with her team to transition our counseling psychology conference and 75th anniversary celebration to a virtual series of cupcakes. She worked with her team to provide us all with a truly amazing virtual APA Liberation Lounge experience. And she has inspired and led us with grace as we re-engaged in the movement to understand and end racism in this country. I would like to present to you, Dr. Annalise Singh. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. You're a gem and it's been an honor to work alongside you and Ruth Bassinger and Debbie Nolan, Lily Piper, and now Amy Reynolds is president-elect, and I'm about to talk about the Liberation Incubator, who's with me in a moment, but I, hello, beloved community of counseling psychology. It is so wonderful to share some time with you uh, today, and of course, I wish it was in person, so thank you for coming today. My name is Annalise Singh. I use she and they pronouns. I'm a light-skinned, mixed-race, South Asian, white-adjacent, Sikh, non-binary person with lots of educational class and ability and U.S. citizenship advantage. Everything I will share with you today is rooted in these identities and experiences. It's been a true honor to have served as your president of the Society of Counseling Psychology this past year. I'm excited to be in conversation with you about my presidential theme, then building a counseling psychology of liberation, which I'm going to say a lot, <laughs> which has been truly a collective endeavor. I titled this talk, Building a Counseling Psycho Liberation, The Path Behind Us, Under Us, and Before Us. As I begin, I want to honor the indigenous land that I am on as I Zoom with you. I'm on land now called New Orleans, Louisiana in the United States of America, land that was unseated, stolen, and from the many indigenous nations that were here and continue to be here, pre-white European colonization, the tribes of the Chittimacha, the Atacapa, and more. Acknowledging the history of the indigenous land that nourishes our work is a part of our everyday collective liberation. So even though we are Zooming from different parts of the world as an SCP community, I invite you to share your name, pronouns, and the history of the indigenous land you are on in the chat box. As I get started, I need to express some gratitude for the many, many co-conspirators and collaborators in my life. I offer my deepest gratitude to the folks here in the Liberation Incubator Presidential Special Task Group, whom I've had the honor of working with alongside the last 18 months, incubating what liberation and counseling psychology might feel like. My liberation incubator co-chair and cutie pox sibling, younger Sib, Della Mosley, and also some incredible humans, Ruben Pelogi, Carlton Green, Elizabeth Cardenas Bautista, Herman Cardenas, Ankita Nakalji, Amy Reynolds and Laura Monero Mesa, thank you for your spirit and your commitment to living the work of liberation every day. Our time together is truly transforming in the best ways, and I can't wait to see how your work continues to challenge our field to expand. I also want to give a shout out to my beloved partner, uh, 
yeah, the tears are going to come. Lauren Lucarilla, who lifts my wings and whispers, fly, believe, soar, and get free. To be loved so well and so deep this past year, and to be able to fall in love with you all over again each day is just, I mean, beyond awesome. I want to thank my family of origin and chosen family in New Orleans and Atlanta who helped me deepen my commitments to liberation and hold me accountable for the everyday work of justice. And I want to thank my white brothers of choice, Theo Burns and Dan Walensky, who have held counsel and accountability with me this past year as a president of color, supporting my leadership as I navigated the origins and vestiges of a historically white guy space. That's who set up this, this structure we're leading of counseling psychology leadership. And I want to also chair, uh, honor my cherished mentor, Dr. Barry Chung, who's been a touchstone for me as a counseling psychologist leader. I wouldn't be here without you, Barry, in many, many ways. Thank you to my counseling psych uh, 2020 tri chairs, who are now siblings, Julia Phillips and Carmen Cruz. Wow, did we have an important, rough, and inspiring journey together? We are now lifers. And gigantic th thanks to Debbie Nolan and Lily Piper, who gave me organizational and thinking time so I could make sure I was dreaming this past year. I'm, there's so many more. I'm, I'm naming some of the folks who've supported me as I've been incubating with this amazing group of people, what a counseling psych of liberation would feel like and how we could transform as a profession. I want to hear from you in the chat box. Who are the freedom fighters, the angelic troublemakers, as Bayard Rustin called them, who have supported you as you lean into this dream of what a counseling psych of liberation could be? I would love to see these names in the chat box. To set additional context for building a counseling psych of liberation, it is important to note that we are always in history-making times when it comes to the struggle for freedom and justice. We are certainly in history-making times right now. The last four months have been really hard. And I wanna take you back to the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic and thank you all for every single minute, second of what you've done to support clients, students, research participants, colleagues, and more. At the beginning of this pandemic, we saw the healthcare and government response that was steeped in anti-Asian racism. The US president continues to call COVID-19 the Chinese virus. We've seen ageism and ableism run rampant as Elliot Kukla summed up in his New York Times opinion article in March 19th of 2020. My life is more disposable during this pandemic. As we remember the beginning of the pandemic, we remember as counseling psychologists how quickly we pivoted and shifted to telehealth, noticing all the inequities that were in place. From queer and trans people who had to shelter in place with families and communities who were dangerous to them, to noticing how people without class advantage and people living with disabilities did not always have access to the technology they needed. In the beginning of the pandemic, we saw that some Black and Latinx communities had internalized racist generational tropes, some believing that they were not as vulnerable to COVID-19 because of the strengths of their body and immunity. When the truth was really that since the beginning of the pandemic, Black and Latinx people were already bearing the brunt of the impact of coronavirus in both infections and deaths due to already existing health inequities. And please, let's not call these health disparities anymore. Per Margaret Whitehead and public health, these are unnecessary and avoidable uh, injustices and um, unfair situations. And this was all while Black and Latinx people were serving in the front lines of essential care for all of us as healthcare and service workers, serving us as they were literally facing death and continue to every day. As these multiple and interlocking oppressions were being revealed across the news and social media, at the beginning of the pandemic, Arundhati Roy wrote a brilliant article titled, The Pandemic is a Portal, where she called us all in to recognize that the world we are living in has completely changed. We have an opportunity, she said in this article, to recognize that we are never going back to the world pre-COVID-19, nor should we because the massive experiences of injustice for people on the margins of society were there and continue to be. A month before Arundhati Roy wrote this article, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Dominique Remy Falls, Rhea Milton, and Rayshar Brooks were all still alive. I wanna pause here and say that again. A month before Arundhati wrote this article, Breonna Taylor, Maud Arbery, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Dominique Remy Falls, Rhea Milton, Rayshar Brooks, and many, many more black and brown people who are murdered by the police or by people who are acting as police. 
we're still alive. Now more than ever, we have the opportunity to build the counseling psychology of liberation that centers black liberation with every breath we take because in working for black liberation, we all get free. I'll get to more of that in a moment. And setting all of this context so we can acknowledge one truth. History will remember the things we decided to change in our profession in 2020. And history will also remember the status quo we decided not to question and continue to uphold in our profession, whether it was white body supremacy, cisgender and straight dominance, able-bodied or wealth supremacy and more. I hope we don't remember 2020 is just the year we canceled the Counseling Psychology 2020 conference because of a pandemic. I wanna look back and say this was the year we felt the impulse towards liberation even more deeply, that we followed the impulse to change everything we thought we knew about what counseling psychology could and should be. What does a counseling psychology of liberation mean? In my monthly presidential announcements, I've defined it in these three brief paragraphs. We all have a personal experience of liberation. It's the feeling deep in our bones when we are all free of the internalized messages we were taught of who we were supposed to be an expansion we feel when we transform these messages into critical consciousness to act upon the world to change it. The project of working toward liberation for all people who experience oppression is one that frees all of us along the way. Liberation is a psychological construct, but it only has meaning when we enact it. Liberation moves us beyond the debates of whether or not we should engage in advocacy and social justice. I'm so done with that. <laughs> I didn't put that in the, pre in the presidential announcements, but I should have. Um, it moves us to envision a world that we want to leave behind as counseling psychologists and actively build towards that world. Think about it. What would a world without racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, ableism, and anti-immigrant sentiment and other oppressions feel like? Building a counseling psychology of liberation helps us dream that this new world can not only exist but there are also specific action steps as counseling psychologists we can take right now to work toward that goal. And this means liberation should take its place alongside our other hallmark counseling psychology values of lifespan, career development, prevention, wellness, multiculturalism, and social justice. It was October of 2018 when we first gathered in the liberation incubator SIG to begin incubating an idea of what a counseling psychology of liberation would feel like and how we could transform as a profession. We started off every meeting with a body check-in. How is our body responding to holding, reacting, numbing, feeling, a host of other emotions as we in explored our individual and collective liberation with one another? We dug into the gifts of liberation psychology, theory, and science from critical theorists, Ignacio Martin Barrow, James Baldwin, Franz Fanon, Gloria Anzaldúa, Derek Bell, Bobby Harrow, Marlene Schulman, Mary Watkins, to Black Women Scholars, Sojourner Truth, Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, Brittany Cooper, and many, many more. We held monthly webinars exploring how we could hashtag live free. In counseling psychology and beyond, we wanted it to be a conversation beyond our profession. Carlton Green and Amy Reynolds designed and facilitated, and we all participated in four-week online liberation process groups with a curriculum that guided members in exploring liberation in our own personal and professional lives. All of this liberation incubation of the question of what would a counseling psychology feel like of liberation was planned to continue as we gathered our disciplines family reunion. We had over a third of the folks who registered for that conference sign up for our pre-conference, Decolonize Your Everything Counseling Psychology, and then COVID-19 hit and the conference was canceled. As the pandemic unfolded, as I noted earlier, in a series of everyday injustices were elevated to everyday social media feeds, we each pivoted into the everyday liberation work in the streets to challenge anti-Black racism, uplift student voices and more. Folks who were begging us, asking us, commanding, demanding that we do this work. As I look back on our collective work, I believe there's a specific pathway we've been on, are on now, and can move forward with in counseling psychology. I happen to be a big fan of top 10 lists as a community organizer, so here we go. Number 10, decolonize and re-indigenize counseling psychology. When we start down a path of building a counseling psychology of liberation, we begin with our own history. We ask critical questions of who wrote the history of counseling psychology? For what purpose and whose benefit does counseling psychology exist? These are complicated questions with many layers as we are taught in our history of psychology courses that William James invented psychology and then our own disciplines history 
currently traces our lineage in the transition from vocational guidance to who we are today. Without critical theories, though, firmly as the ground for counseling psychology, we are left with a history that has largely been written by and defined by white men and then later by white women. As Nigerian no novelist Chinua Achebe reminded us all, there is that great proverb that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Now, I'm not saying we should all throw away the contributions of white men and white women. <laughs> However, a key tenet of liberation psychology is articulated by Martine Barrow as recovering historical memory. This tenet asks us to go deeper and to note the larger perspective of the oppressed on this history. From a decolonized and re-indigenized perspective, what are the other roots of counseling psychology? I ask this question as I do, my own colonized brain in counseling psychology starts to open up with possibilities. I remember that in group counseling, we kind of acknowledge that humans have sat in circles for healing with roots in indigenous peoples, maybe. I begin to imagine that there have been methods for mental health healing since the beginning of humanity, which would mean the cradle and the birth of counseling psychology would sit right on the continent of Africa and then follow human migration. I start to get excited about the project of recovering these historical memories so that I can learn how we can all inform the history of our profession, how we even practice, research, teach, and train today. Why is history so important in the building of a counseling psych of liberation? James Baldwin in his White Man's Guilt essay reminds us this. History, as no, nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read. And it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us are unconsciously cult controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It, would, it could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we all owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. For this reason, we must find every way we can in everything we do the possibility of naming how colonization, erasure of indigenous peoples, and more influence our understandings of what counseling psychology is today in the name of what we might, we might become in the aim of liberation. Number nine, center lack liberation in everything we do in counseling psychology. As we begin to decolonize and re-indigenize counseling psychology, we start to decenter dominant white male narratives and we come face to face with our internalized whiteness as a discipline. Yes, we strive for multiculturalism. Yes, we strive for social justice. Yes, to all the ways that we got to multiculturalism and social justice, they were through the vocational discussions in our field that later led to examinations of the interminglings of career and racism, career and anti queer entrance, bias, and other experiences of oppression. However, building a counseling psych of liberation allows us to deepen our work in this area and to center Black liberation, which means many things. Mostly, it means understanding that until we have this explicit goal, Black people in our profession continue to experience harm in the form of micro and macro abuses. And I lean on Ibram Kinde's urging of us all to move away from the language of microaggressions to the more, more truthful term of micro abuses. In our recent racial affinity groups within the Society of Counseling Psychology after the police officer David Chavan murdered George Floyd, where we gathered in black, non-black people of color and white spaces to uproot anti-blackness in counseling psychology, we heard the same story that has been there since the beginning of our profession. The exclusionary and white supremacy norms of counseling psychology are harming black people. Centering black liberation in counseling psych means we trust and believe these lived experiences and stories and get busy right now in reducing the harm that black people have experienced in our profession. While our colonized minds tell all of us, white counseling psychologists and BIPOC counseling psychologists included that to center black liberation is too big of a stretch. I wanna note it's already happening. It always has in our field. Our job as non-black people of color and white folks in counseling psychology is to follow black leadership right now, literally right now. Dr. Ella Mosley and counseling psychology doctoral student Paris Bellamy are leading a black liberation movement called Academics for Black Survival and Wellness. We have a compass of black liberation that Dr. Della Mosley and her Wells Research Collective have gifted us in the article, Critical Consciousness of Anti-Black Racism, a practical model to prevent and resist racial trauma. It's all there. We have the work of radical healing from Dr. Helen Neville and her co-conspirators. 
We have a call for counseling psychologists to write op-eds challenging anti-Black racism from Dr. Kevin Coakley. And we know about the science of how anti-Black racism works and lodging the brain and body from Dr. Azamin Ariassi, while Dr. Candace Hargens has provided counseling psychology a treasure in the form of the Black Lives Matter healing meditations. Dr. Carlton Green and Dr. Ruben Filogi and so many more are leading and teaching from a Black liberatory focus and practice in higher ed. Our job in building a counseling psych of liberation is to believe the lived experiences of Black counseling psychologists and to follow their leadership without overburdening Black people. That's happening a lot right now. A lot of stuff is going to get in the way of us centering Black liberation, hence number eight. We need to name, interrogate, and unlearn internalized whiteness in counseling psychology. And to do that, we all have the job of breaking with white solidarity in counseling psych. This means bringing our decolonization work into every counseling psych syllabi, every counseling psych practice room, every counseling psych research space. And again, yes, multiculturalism is, is important. Advocacy, yes, important. Social justice, of course, yes, important. But if these values and practices we hold dear to us are not grounded in the large project and work of liberation, we are lost. We are vulnerable to continuing to uh, work from our internalized whiteness and we continue to do harm to black people and other people of color communities. How do we break with white solidarity? We start with the groundbreaking work of Dr. Janet Helms on the racial identity development of white people and people of color right at the center of her white racial identity development theory is where she shows us what Robin D'Angelo and Carol Anderson respectively call white fragility and white rage. It's gonna show up. As we center Black liberation in our profession, white counseling psychologists will resist with everything in them. Not because they are bad people, but because in counseling psych, we have not adopted the practices Helms noted in white racial identity development we need that are key to noticing when white folks are in disintegration, pseudo-independence, and more. And we haven't applied these schemas to our everyday work in counseling psychology for white folks. There is a literal retreat in racial identity development where white folks resist the work with everything in them. We have lots of research for what to do with this in the counseling room, but we don't apply this work to what happens in our counseling psychology settings. For instance, when BIPOC students are calling in white faculty, white supervisors, white trainers, and on their racism. Similarly, we have not established counseling psychology practices for how to apply white uh, racial identity development for how non-Black people of color and Black counseling psychologists are continuously moving into immersion and immersion to find comfort and protection that BIPOC communities need to, to handle the experiences we have in counseling psych program research and practice environments. If we know a huge part of BIPOC racial identity development is a different type of retreat, a retreat for comfort. We know this will also be what BIPOC folks experience in our counseling psych settings. And as Resma Minikim teaches us in my, and just please get his book, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. There are everyday practices we can use to heal from what he terms white body supremacy and then start to realize that racial identity development, yes, but the epigenetics of racial trauma go back at least 14 generations. That means we're all carrying racial trauma that go back that far. We're carrying it into counseling psychology spaces, whether we're white or BIPOC, 14 generations of it. And so building a counseling psychology of liberation means we have to build that container to recognize and affirm that racial trauma is everywhere. We center black liberation and we look at internalized whiteness when we ask ourselves over and over again, ask yourself right now, how does internalized whiteness show up in me in counseling psychologists? in psych counseling psychology. And then ask it again, how does internalized whiteness show up in me, whether I'm a black, indigenous person of color, white psychologist, and then repeat it again. How does internalized whiteness show up in me? How does it show up in counseling psychology? As we gain understandings of our individual internalization of whiteness, then we can look at resources explicating how white body supremacy culture shows up in all of our profession, in everyday practices, from the performance of white time structures, white policies and procedures, in the worship of the white written word, the push out of BIPOC people from our profession, 
valuing of quantity over quality, the perfectionism, the power hoarding, and the right to white comfort. I call in the work of Kenneth Johnson and Tema Akan for the white culture supremacy characteristics that we can look to to guide us in this way. Number seven, uplift the liberation of brown and black trans women and non-binary communities in counseling psychology. Folks, this is a deep one, deeper than we think. At its surface, we know that the average life expectancy of BIPOC trans women is 35 years old. Let that number truly sink into your mind. Some of you are not yet 35. Some of you are right at that age and some of us are long past that age. See if your heart starts to feel some grief when I say that number again. Black and brown trans women can expect an average life expectancy of 35 years old. When I say that again, I feel my heart break and then I feel some numbing. We must all feel that heartbreak and then move past that numbing retreat to get to really busy at building a counseling psych of liberation where black and brown trans women have unfettered access to our discipline. And so we question how our admissions practices and our own participation and ignoring and neglecting their histories in the world have led us to a place where we have silences about black and brown trans liberation in our curriculum and our training. As we decolonize and re-indigenize counseling psychology, we have the opportunity to tell the truth about gender and how colonization and anti-BIPOC racism were powerful erasers of the existence, value, and sacredness of people who are outside the binary of man, of woman. In the fall of 2018, I began to get the first inquiries from black and brown trans women who wanted to come study with me because of their research with trans and non-binary people of color. They would ask me what their experiences would be like in counseling psychology programs. They would ask me about how well-trained faculty, supervisors, and incoming students were to be affirming. They didn't even ask about liberation. I had to tell them the same thing I have to tell, I've had to tell white, trans, and non-binary students previously. Our programs are not safe. Our training is not sufficient. You will experience harm and I still want you to come here. I don't know how much I can protect you, but I will give you shelter in our profession every way I can. This is literally the most fucked up thing to have to tell a student, even more so than to bring this conversation to faculty who then continue to not hear, to not listen, to not act. I'm begging all of us, building a counseling psychology of liberation means we build a discipline where BIPOC, trans and non-binary students, they don't find their lives as a specialty to learn about outside of counseling psychology, but rather we center their lives and make sure every counseling psychology we have is where one BIPOC students, practitioners, researchers see their profession building a more gender liberatory world. Number six, recognize that patriarchy has harmful and lasting effects. I remember that I was the women's studies minor as a student at Tulane University. And I, I read this book, Gerda Lerner's The Creation of Patriarchy was 1991. As a mixed race, South Asian, white adjacent, queer and non-binary person raised in the deep South, patriarchy was operating on my life in powerful ways I couldn't yet identify. Reading Lerner's book was like finding new depth in my lungs to breathe. She articulated that patriarchy had outlived itself. It had outlived its original purpose to procreate. Yet patriarchy was still inside all of us, operating, internalized in deep and profound ways. I remember I went on a journey to root out where patriarchy lived within me. And I found ways that I had carefully practiced scripts, speaking, ways to act around cisgender straight men so I wouldn't get hurt. I learned to align myself in doing so with patriarchy so I could move forward, so I could have a little less harm, so I could live my life with some self-determination. How have you internalized patriarchy? How are we all enforcing it? And it's not just a white patriarchy, that we've internalized, it's a BIPOC patriarchy. BIPOC matriarchs have had to resist this every day, even though BIPOC women, cis and trans women have done most of the emotional, physical, mental and spiritual labor in so many of our personal and professional spaces. Building a counseling psychology of liberation means we look to womanism, feminism, specifically black feminist scholars and leaders who've been doing this work for years. And then we connect this work to our practice, research, training and more, for instance, we saw the Me Too movement first founded by a black feminist, a woman, Tarana Burke in 2006, calling us all in to address the insidious experience of sexual violence in everyday society. 
in 2017 as the hashtag Me Too movement on social media continued, it is noticeable that we did not lean in publicly within counseling psychology to have this discussion. Not about sexual violence, not about the driver of that violence, patriarchy, and not about any of the intersections of that interlocking oppression that also drives this violence. We know that one in three folks who identify as women, one in six eight to eight folks that identify as men experience sexual violence. And we do not talk about this in counseling psychology. We talk about serving other people. People are coming into our programs with experiences of sexual violence. People are teaching in our programs with experience of sexual violence enacted and experiences and not of just survival. Some learn to thrive and heal. But we need to talk about this and find new ways to heal. And this means creating spaces to talk about the fact that we are all wounded healers, finding ways imperfectly to support wounded people. And that means there are a lot of power and control dynamics that are always present that we can acknowledge, recognize, lean in, interrogate, and create new practices to heal from. I start to get excited about that work as I name it. Patriarchy has long and harmful effects in counseling psychology. How can we tie this knowing to the things we care about in counseling psychology? The counseling process, our training, counseling outcomes, career self-efficacy, the art and science of counseling, and more. Building a counseling psychology of liberation calls us all in to examine how the mental, emotional, sexual, and spiritual violence of patriarchy moves and lives within us and how we can root it out. Number five, no adultism is the root of all oppression, including within counseling psychology. Adultism is the valuing of adult perspectives over all others, the power that adults have over young people. One of the main reasons I think we have not examined more deeply how patriarchy, anti-black racism, racism in general, anti-trans ableism, classism, and other oppressions have driven inequities. I think one of that reasons rests within adultism. And it's not just that oppression is experienced by children and adolescents, but I think it extends in our discipline to people who are actually young or perceived as young. Young students, young faculty, young practitioners, young researchers. Adultism teaches us as young people the scripts of what can be said, engaged, and most importantly, what must not be said in everyday interactions. In doing so, adultism creates conditions where we are taught to accept all of the supremacies and dominances from fat prejudice, internalized whiteness, ableism, xenophobia, heterosexism, sexism, and more. Within counseling psychology, how can we counter adultism? We know in our faculty interactions, it sounds like don't speak until you're tenured, but how does it operate in the counseling relationship where there's an expert in the room? Let me take us all back to our families, to those adultist scripts right now Remember our families? How did each of us learn in our own families, even if we had wonderful caregivers? How did we learn or how did the world teach us not to lose our, use our voice? And how are we each taught through adultism to doubt ourselves, opp accept oppressive scripts? Think of the children that you might see in your life right now or might be raising, and you can see the freedom and liberation in their bodies and spirits before adultism teaches them something different. You can see how children care for one another and use gentle touch when folks are hurting. And you can see how they giggle and belly laugh with their entire bodies. And you can also see the points where they lose this. And the devastation we feel when we learn we can't protect them. Building a counseling psych of liberation means we're going back to reclaim those parts of ourselves that got hurt by dominance. And then learning to how we enact that dominance of adultism by aligning with power. Let's all ask ourselves right now, how is adultism influencing my everyday interactions, decisions, assumptions, and more, whether I'm a student, early career, mid-career, or late career professional? Number four, learn our migrant stories as counseling psychologists to hear, heal from historical trauma. As we look back on the influence adultism has had on how we come to learn about or not, about how we can or cannot use our voice and power you know, we often think about our migrant stories pretty rarely, maybe in a multicultural class, a helping skills or a family counseling class with maybe a geneogram. When we come to more holistically and truthfully learn about the migrant stories of our families and communities, we come face to face with the healing demanded across generations. Those of us who are Black, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander heritage, Middle Eastern, white, mixed race, 
those of us who are not indigenous to the land that we are on, whether because our family generations were moved by the forces of colonization or anti-Black racism, or whether our families were the colonizers and aligned with the colonizers. There's an opportunity in learning that story to begin to heal from historical trauma. I can tell you as the child of an Indian Sikh father who experienced the British colonization, the partition of India and Pakistan, where he experienced Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs who had lived amongst each other peacefully for years, then murder, rape, and commit other acts of horrific violence during partition, the British colonization of India. I have never once had a place to explore how this historical trauma of white supremacy and colonization affected my own life in counseling psychology. I've gone to counseling to address how the trauma numbed my dad out from being present with me in his own life and how I developed unhealthy and healthy skills to deal with his numbing behaviors. My white mom's history goes back to the first white colonizers on this indigenous land we now call the United States, who were from Scotland and were adjacent to the white enslavers of black people. She, like all people, numbed herself to the brutality of whiteness and handed that on to me as anti-black racism. I had to teach myself how to cope with and deal with these historical traumas handed to me, which was confusing, painful, and at times liberating. Imagine if I had a frame of reference for how to do this as a counseling psychologist, Imagine if there was space for all of us to learn our migrant histories of experience and enacted trauma over generations. That would mean that we could do the healing we need to do and that when we are asked to take action on DACA, the injustices of ICE and more, it's not just advocacy we're doing. We're working for our liberation. We're working for liberation, for reparation. Number three, find ways to live in our bodies more as counseling psychologists. One of the greatest gifts of the Liberation Incubator has been our body check-ins. We ask us ourselves each time, and we take the time we need countering white supremacy notions of there isn't enough time to check in with our bodies, to name what our bodies are experiencing as we work to center black liberation, uplift queer and trans experiences, and counter other oppressions. We slow down and make time, countering notions of white time to move at what Adrienne Marie Brown calls the speed of trust. Now, don't get me wrong, we still feel the urgency to go fast and produce. That urgency is there. Heck, we mapped out an entire 12 months of building a counseling psych of liberation for how we could get and live free as counseling psychologists. But we also resisted urgency at each step. We were prepared to reinvent, refocus, reconnect, re-inspire at any moment. We focused on developing critical connections more than critical mass. And we focused on building the resilience by building the relationships, as Adrian Marie Brown says. Take a moment to pay attention to your body right now and how you can use your body in the counseling psychology of liberation. Number two, plan for generational change and create a nexus of liberation leaders. Our counseling psychology uh, society has always understood the importance of planning for the next generation of leaders. For that next generation is key for our survival. However, when we put liberation at the core center of what we do in counseling psychology, we realize that building a pipe leaders who are on the margins, just, it, it's just not going to work. It's kind of gross. It's, it's a very enacted trauma because we haven't yet dismantled white supremacy or other oppressive structures. It, that pipeline is always be a leaky and a bumpy one because BIPOC, queer and trans people, people live, living with disabilities and other folks on the margins continue to experience oppression at every level. Think about our recent SCP election. While we had majority POC candidates elected, notably two important Latinx men, none of the black candidates were elected. There are many layers to this, of course, and we've been exploring this in SCP cabinet and exec board. Our, it's our SCP membership. It's the ways that SCP lineage pushes forward some folks and not others. Regardless of the reasons, when we really think about it, we can't rely on traditional structures within SCP or any other counseling psychology setting to give us the liberation we want to see and experience. Building a counseling psych of liberation means we dream bigger and act bolder. Within SCP right now, we pay vendors who are awesome to help us in the everyday work of the division. And this means right now, right now, we can pay a nexus of black leaders for their knowledge and experience. So we are accountable in SCP for creating structures that do not harm black and other communities of color and those on the margins. There are other ways we can expand this to everyday liber uh, reparative work in counseling psychology. And when we create a nexus of liberation leaders across many lived identities, we begin to more meaningfully identify the exact work that each generation of counseling psychology has 
and the dismantling of all oppression. Here's number one, folks. Know that another world of liberation is possible and then build this liberation in this world within counseling psychology. As we build this counseling psychology of liberation, we can and should experience tremendous resistance within and outside of ourselves. I call Arundhati's Roy's name in her article, The Pandemic is a Portal. In this article, she is speaking to India amidst the coronavirus pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic, and her words ring true for us as well. She said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and to imagine our world new. One is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice, our hatred, our avarice, our data banks, our dead ideas, our dead rivers and skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Students and ECPs, so many of you are leading us in our liberation movements right now. You always have, and you always will. And a counseling psychology of liberation designs careful links to your experiences of liberation, accountability, as accountability. I believe and trust and will work for your vision of our field for the rest of my life. Mid-career professionals and late career professionals, I know we are tired and feel like the work we've done isn't always valued. The work of building a counseling psychology of liberation, we actively develop accountability networks that help us remember we have a long way to go in unlearning our own oppression and our own participation in oppressive systems that we've internalized and that impact the lives of those less senior to us. These can be accountability networks that hold us and help us retrain, relearn, and lean in and support the most challenging conversations about the liberation we can have in counseling psychology. We can nourish ourselves for each step in the journey. We can use our power and advantage for these conversations that challenge our very own resistance assumptions and practices because we know they are key to us all getting free in counseling psychology. For all of us across the lifespan, when we develop a counseling psychology of liberation, we honor that liberation is love. That love is liberation. So we know that the ruptures we experience in liberation work can be healed over time with accountability and feedback, which are also forms of love. We have so much to offer the world, my beloved community of counseling psychology. We've laid out important foundation for our values and it is time to level up. So let's level up now and push farther than we ever thought we could and dreaming what the beloved community really is in counseling psychology and can be. We don't have to dismantle everything, but we do need to dismantle many things. And mostly we need to dismantle the parts of our hearts that have been taught to be numb to the pain that people on the margins of our profession experience so we can step into the lineage of true and deep healing. We are healers in counseling psychology and we are wounded. It's time to acknowledge the truth of that complexity so we can dig into the power dynamics and positionality and potentialities for liberation in our interaction with others and with ourselves. And I know this all seems really big, almost impossible. I know parts of your brain are thinking it ain't gonna happen. Oppression works that way. It's designed that and justice doesn't want to be questioned. But as Arundhati Roy said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way on a quiet day. I can hear her breathing. Another world is possible in counseling psychology with liberation. It's actually already here and being worked on. It's always been here. It's time for us to pay attention. We can be in a liberation movement that will not be stopped. And as we do that liberation work, we can bring it be brought into the fullness of our own humanity. And we can think of folks like Representative John Lewis who fought for the beloved community with his each to his very last breath. And when we hear his words, we can see a compass for liberation inside of us. He reminded us of this at the time of his very own death. He said, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and to stand up for what you truly believe. As I end, I invite us all to place your right hand over your heart, if that feels comfortable to you. 
if it feels comfortable to you, please close your eyes. But if not, many of us are carrying trauma. So keep your eyes open gently or gaze at the floor or the keyboard in front of you. With that right hand over your heart, I want you to imagine that first moment you said yes to counseling psychology. Remember your admissions, you know, your excitement, your fear, breathe in all the emotions and experience that were here with you that moment you said yes. Take a deep breath there. There's a lot there. Next, place your left hand over your right hand that is still on your heart. Take a deep breath and imagine what that same meeting of counseling psychology might have been like, felt like, if you were entering a counseling psychology of liberation. If you were told on that very first day of your acquaintance with counseling psychology, you were told the whole point of our training, of our profession, was to get free. Take a deep breath in and imagine all that is possible in this moment of your very first meeting. All the things that are possible in that moment of yes. Take in another deep breath and imagine the very next step right now you might take in building that counseling psychology of liberation. So the people who are going to get acquainted with our profession, our division, counseling psychology in fall, right now, they're starting. Imagine all the things you can say to them right now. Your role in building that counseling psychology of liberation. That data, that information that's right inside of you, it's the work only you can do in your own unique way. So let's take a breath of gratitude here for this information that's inside of each of us. That's the counseling psychology of liberation. It's not com complicated, it's right inside of you. And as we end, I just ask you to slowly open your eyes. Take in how that felt. Let's all get and live free in solidarity and connection and accountability and in deep love. It's been an honor to lead SCP in these times. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just going to be quiet and kind of listen to the liberation incubator and probably cry my ass out. <laughs> thank you. So this is time for Liberation Incubator folks to react. Um, folks in the chat box, you may have things you want to say or challenge or or say hell yes to. Uh, this I'm very clear this was a collective, so I wanted we have about six minutes where folks can share. That damn white time, <laughs> white time. <laughs> yeah, we deserve a pause. You deserve a pause to take in this chat, <sighs> to take in this love. We owe you so much and I hope you can receive it. Thank you for leading us through this time. You were the leader we needed. You are the leader we need. Hmm. Um, I hope everyone listening is accountable to what was just shared, what was just shared in this talk and what's been shared over this last year. Annalise, you have modeled so much for us. Thank you for speaking liberation into counseling psychology. We needed it. Our world needs it. And you made it so clear and plain. The invitation so present for folks. And everyone's walking into it. And so thank you for that. I think that the other note that I, I just want to thank you for the permission you gave all year. You created spaces for so many people to speak within counseling psychology who don't get to speak to and through counseling psychology and counseling psychologists. And they're the folks who we need to hear from. 
thank you for modeling for everyone in SCP and how to pass the mic. And folks were watching the way Annalise mentored me over the last year. Like there's so many ways you could see what she created, what she creates. They make space for so many folks and in doing so make space for so many folks. And we all have that capacity and you just presented so much, I mean, throughout your life's work and in this talk for folks to see how to do that. And that's a gift. Thank you for naming and centering blackness and teaching folks how to do that. And I'll pass the mic. Thank you. I just want to say very quickly, Annalise, to what you said earlier, that as white faculty supervisors and trainers, we can no longer wait to be called in. We have to step up and step outside of our comfort zone and, and do the, I wrote in the chat, the deprogramming and reprogramming that we need to do. There's not a single corner of our field where liberation is not essential. It is the antidote and it is what we will use to inoculate us going forward. And so it's been an honor, Annalise. I said last night in the incubator, um, I feel like my heart, my brain, my very essence has been changed as a result of this 18 month journey with you and the rest of the folks on this uh, panel. Um, and I can't thank you enough. Pass the mic. I really just want to thank you, Annalise, for inviting um, and doing what um, so many, for me, women have done across the years, specifically women, women of color with regards to saying, come sit at this table, little black boy, and let's, let's figure out how to do something different. Um, so I really appreciate that. I also want to just name that one of the things that you've consistently done for us, which you've already named, is that you have made it possible for us to be fully embodied human beings in the context of these conversations and to remind people that our bodies are really important. How do we listen to the, the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from our bodies, which is really transformative for so many people who don't go anywhere near their own bodies, although they walk in them every day. So to be very intentional about that, we really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And then the last piece that I just want to say is that it kind of is along with the, the body piece is that for you to always be talking about how to love each other or how to bring love to this work is so transformative um, because in professional spaces, we dare not use that four letter word, but you have really tried to normalize for us how to do that and how to be that with each other. So really just thank you for that um, immensely. I'm passing the mic. I feel so much love and hope and joy and freedom uh, in these last 18 months. And um, it's been such a privilege and such an honor to be part of this. And you've, I mean, modeled everything so perfectly. There was uh, even your monthly announcements were just so thoughtful and I emailed you once, I printed them and put it up on my wall because I just needed that reminder. Um, you modeled leadership, you modeled what is possible for us and you actually proved it. Like, yeah, we can do it. We can have a counseling psychology of liberation and you showed us how. Um, so thank you. Yes, Annalise, thank you so much. Um, I said in the chat that I, I don't think I've ever seen a more holistic um, leader in just the way that you um, exist and in the way that you are. And, and I, I really, I, I hope that you know how much you transformed our lives and how much you, for me, make me think about how we can move forward and continue to transform, um, you know, our field, ourselves, and and the way that we do things. Um, it's it's a gift that, you know, I'll, I'll just carry with me 
forever. Um, and, you know, I'm so thankful for um, everyone um, who's been a part of the Liberation Incubator who has taught me so many different ways um, in which we can exist. Um, so thank you for uplifting the voices of many, many who commonly are, are not centered, especially um, in the field of counseling psychology overall. So thank you for just reminding me to exist. Dr. Singh, Annalise, thank you for just being that example that we all need and to remind us that we all have the power within ourselves to challenge the structures that exist, that we can use our roles, our privileges, and our voices to make the change today. Thank you for showing us that we all have the ability to go out and search for the knowledge that's already out there, to center the voices that we are refusing to center, and to make sure that in every space that we walk in, that we do it with our heads held up and take up as much space as we need, because it is time. And so I appreciate and love that you have the ability to bring so many amazing people together and thank you for doing the work and stepping aside and letting the other voices be heard when needed. And that is something that is not normal, but thank you for making that normal in our field. So I appreciate you and everyone else here on this call and so much love and gratitude to you and to everyone else. Annalise, I have so much gratitude for you. Um, you are an inspirational leader a truly transformational figure. And um, I think of you sort of like an older, wiser, um, awesome uh, sister that I never had. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for all of us um, here in the incubator. I think you've, you've helped, empowered each of us in, in, in the ways that we needed, or maybe in the ways that we didn't even know that we needed. Um, and I think as you mentioned, we are in deep, we're in a deep uh, set of crises. We are in a political crisis, in a global pandemic. Um, we are in a moment of undeniable racism, right? We're becoming aware that racism is, is, is part of everyday life, uh, of, of patriarchy, of class-based oppression. Uh, we, we're in a deeply troubling time. And I think that through your vision, you help set up the field so that we can actually contribute something that will help liberate us and uh, get us out of the reality that we're in um, and into the future, into a more beautiful uh, and just world. So thank you for doing that um, because um, what you've done is gonna ripple through time. Annalise. Annalise in the audience. I don't think there's any doubt that things are getting worse uh, for the masses of people in this country and across the globe. Um, and at the same time, the consciousness of um, the masses is increasing. And as Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture might say, um, this is the conditions for revolution. Um, this is the revolution. It's here. <laughs> It's here, and ironically, it is being televised. Um, <laughs> telehealth, if we want to go that way, or, or video conference. Um, and these are the leaders. And I am honored to be um, in your presence, in the presence of these other um, soldiers for liberation and the other ones on this call who aren't up on the, up on the screen, so to speak. Um, and so I just want to say I'm grateful. I remember when you called me 18 months ago, and essentially you told me you were putting together uh, a liberation all-star team. And I usually don't say yes on the spot. I'm very boundary, but I think I said yes on the spot that day. <laughs> and if I didn't, I said it in my heart. Um, I think um, what she did is she created a beautiful space of um, trans transformational creative leaders um, in our own ways, in our own individual lives, our professional environments. Um, and on top of that, Annalise not only gave us autonomy, but she modeled liberation. Um, 
liberation now, living now. Live now is what this is about, what Annalise did. She had a vision and she lived it and she created it. And we happen to be a part of it and I'm so grateful. Um, community now, accountability now, fellowship now, love now, vision now, institutional change now. Um, and so if anybody has doubt or fear about liberation not being possible, um, it is because I've seen it with Annalise, I've seen it with these other folks who are part of the Liberation Incubator. I'm seeing it in everyday people. The revolution is here, y'all, and we can win. And I think the Liberation Incubator is a seed. I think it's a seed that it's going to grow, not only in counseling site, but in APA and across our institutions, because the time is now to live free, folks. So thank you, Annalise, and thank you for the other folks who have made this a beautiful journey um, as a part of the Liberation Incubator. I'm grateful. I love you all. Love you too. Um, we are about to transition to our business and awards meeting. There's going to be um, a little video about building and counseling and psychology of liberation. So I hope you can join us. Della, Amy, Carlton, Elizabeth, Laura, Ruben, Herman, Angita, Vlad. Thank you.